Hello yep. and welcome to Justice Losers, the most unqualified podcast with more irrelevant questions about entertainment, namely movies, TVs, and comics. I'm your host, Preston, joined as always by my delightful co-host, Matt. That Matt. And joined for the, oh, probably about fourth time. Roughly. Our good buddy, Brendan. I'm not going to make the joke that Matt made because I'm a professional. <laughs> Do not talk with that toothpick <laughs> in your mouth the entire episode. The toothpick? The, huh? The toothpick? The toothpick? Pretty sure I said toothpick. Doesn't matter. Who cares? James Bond. What a guy. What a dude. This is plural. Dudes. <gasps> yeah, true. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. This is episode 200. We've done 200 episodes. I'm so sorry. Plus reviews. Plus many, many reviews. Yep. Solid handful of reviews. Oh my god. Two minisodes? Two minisodes in there? Yeah, maybe, we had... Maybe three. Maybe three, if you include, I think, the Christmas episode yeah. from last year. Yep. Anyway. Anyway. Uh, this is our last content episode for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, as many people... As you might know from our announcements of previous episodes, uh, and also the Instagram post that I made, yes, I will have made it by then. I mean, it's created. It's on my phone. Right. I just haven't posted it. Uh, yeah, we, uh, we'll, we're continuing doing episodes every week. Yep. Uh, it's just going to alternate between what you've been up to's, and then the next week is news. Yep. Uh, so we'll just spend a little bit more time on it. There might be some short episodes in there. Sure. Um, but Matt and I have... Uh, limited time as it is mm -hmm. researching content takes time and yep. we have not been doing it justice and so we are readjusting how we're going to do content it will come back come back eventually uh more thoroughly researched and maybe in a different uh formula we'll so, see we'll we see how that goes we've got some ideas percolating yep percolating percolating That's percolator hmm uh yeah Anyway. Talk about James Bond today, though. Boy, are we. It is, uh, when is uh, No Time to Die come out? October 5th. October Maybe. 5th. When does this episode come out? Hopefully before then. Definitely before then, but pretty uh, close. Could have another delay. Who knows? Before. Oh, don't. Don't. <laughs> oh, it's going to make us look real bad if there is a delay between recording and releasing. Just yeah. edit it out. Huh? Well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what we're going to do, we have our friend Brendan on today. And that is because Brendan is a massive nerd about James Bond. Uh, you've seen all of the movies? Yes. Multiple times? Yes. Probably a select several of them many, many multiple times. You have your favorites. Um, Matt has seen... I've seen a majority. Almost all of them. I've seen uh, some of them. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen the original, like the first two... Because uh, I was going to try to do a marathon, and then I got busy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I have also seen, in an in, in hor horrifically incorrect order, all of the at least passable Daniel Craig one. Da Daniel Craig. Yes, that's his name. Daniel Craig ones. I haven't seen Quantum of Solace, but I've seen uh, Casino. I've seen Spectre. I've seen Skyfall. Did he count Spectre as one of the passable ones? I hear it's better than Quantum of Solace. It's a That's, low bar. Yeah, low bar, but, I was, but, but my filter question. was just to filter out that one. <laughs> valid, valid. I think Quantum of Solace might be a worse movie, but it's a more interesting movie. Okay, well, it's really we, close to being really good. I have, we might get into that. Yeah, I, I I like to discuss that a little bit more. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm, I'm with uh, you, but so what? What I kind of want to do this might be a little bit of a long one because there's a lot to discuss because it's an entire franchise with, with two people who have seen a lot of them and, and there's like 24, 26 24, movies. Yeah. Twenty four movies. It's like, doing, it's like Coming doing an episode just on the MCU and expecting yep. it to be short. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. buckle in. Um, the way we're going to kind of do this, because I haven't seen them, like all of them, and haven't read a single book. Matt, you've read a few in the past. I have read the several of the books. It's been a little while. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, and I have not. I've read the Young Bond books whenever oh, I was in like sixth grade. Those were my jam about that time, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I've not touched one of the books. So what we're going to do, we we're going to really... talk about it all for a little bit. We're going to talk about sure. the movies and stuff like that. And then also talk about kind of what makes James Bond. Um, like, who is James Bond? Who, uh, who are James Bond? Who are James? 
Jamothy Bondes, Bondeson, Jam- James Agar Bondagon. <laughs> Brenda, do you get that joke? I don't know if you get that joke. I'm picturing it in my head, and it's just a weird image. It's uh, There's a character in The Inhumans, which was the terrible movie that TV show, TV show that came out for the MCU. Uh, and one of the characters' name is Black Bolt. But his full name is Blackgar Boltagon. <laughs> Super stupid. Uh, and then we've got a little game at the end uh, just to uh, pit the two of you guys against each other. And I will be mediating that because I am unqualified. Uh, for the viewers, for the watchers, mm-hmm. the video consumers, you can see that we are all drinking martinis. Not completely accurate. They're used bourbon, bourbon, not vodka. But my dad was making them and gave them to us. So we're taking them. Yeah, Up absolutely. Martinis. They're pretty great. Um, for the uh, audio listeners... <laughs> That's un- irrelevant. <laughs> For the audio <laughs> listeners. I was really hoping you would choke yourself on that. Matt is sipping on a nice barrel-aged bourbon with a cherry inside of the glass. Gage so James Bond, let's... Uh... <laughs> Gage is going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> um, What is James Bond? James Bond is a... It- fictional spy for the spy agency mi6 created by ian fleming uh based loosely at least on his experiences working in naval intelligence i believe during world war ii um it's supposed to be an amalgamation of a bunch of different people that he met that were more out in the field he was more kind of a behind the scenes kind of guy um but he smushed them all together and fin- uh made it a little more fantastical and wrote some books about it those books turned out to be pretty popular, so they made some movies about them. Are uh, books still coming out? He's dead, isn't he? Oh, long dead. Long oh, dead. okay. But books My are still still stands. Our books, books are still coming out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, it's kind of think of the same way of uh, Tolkien. Oh, okay. Esteem. We have we have the estate, and the estate can approve on one author's writings. Like the Young Bond books came out in the late nineties, early two thousands, I think. Mid odds, I think. Yeah, and so I mean. At that point, I think he died in six, in the late 60s. Okay. Yeah. Roughly. So, you know, yeah. think but, for yourself on that timeline. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They, yeah, they're still doing books. Yeah. Okay. They've been doing movies since 1962. 62. Well, uh, when did you say he died? 67. Uh, 67. Okay, so he got to see the first... Yep. First couple. First and couple he, come out. He hated Dr. No. Hmm. Why? He just thought it was not in line with his vision. He didn't really like it. Well, hmm. how about that? He liked Sean Connery. As, and, like, as James Bond? Or right, just and, Sean Connery? and I've heard some some stories to where, because Scott, Sean Connery is Scottish, that's why Ian Fleming decided to kind of retcon Bond's background of saying that he is of Scottish lineage yeah. and descent. Oh. As I understand it, his backstory wasn't really fleshed out prior to the movies coming out. Yeah. Okay. And so he's... He took a couple of the Connery elements and mm-hmm. worked them in there, hmm. including the Scottishness. And the creation of the character. Is some, something I loved was that he wanted him to have the most boring name imaginable. James Bond is a real person. He's an ornith- he's an American ornithologist. <laughs> and he thought, well, I, that's, that's so interesting that he want, that, that James Bond was intended to be the most boring name. And now it just like culturally has so much force behind it yeah yep now all <laughs> the spies no, he, have jb as their initials but he oh, wanted god really oh, god. jason Bourne. oh oh no how oh, many god. more george smiley i can spell words <laughs> but the idea was he wanted to have someone who was jack black oh yeah he's a spy jack bauer who jack bauer 24 what's uh What's the 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 Jack Jack Ryan? Jack Ryan, that's a B. That's not a B. Jack Bryan. <gasps> also, if you just like kind of bend the R a little bit, it's a B. Jack Bryan. Jack yeah, Jack Bryan. Yeah. Anyway, Brendan, what were you saying? I inter- interrupted you like twice. <laughs> uh um no, he he wanted him to be kind of like a boring looking guy, boring sounding guy mm-hmm. that interesting things happen to. And really exotic, wild things happen to. It's a very British way of looking at things. That's really interesting. Like you said, that's like his origin, like what his intent was for the books mm-hmm. and the character. Yeah, and yeah. the character is that like? For, do you recall that being yes. very much? That's 
I don't really remember that being the thing in the movies at all. Like, I feel like that aspect has just completely disappeared from the movies. Because in movies, I don't think that actually translates very well. If anything, it translates more to a comedy. That's true. Yep. Just have normal uptight British guy and all of a sudden throw him in the middle of India. And all of a sudden there's, you know, a tiger here and people dancing around and someone with rocket propelled boobs or whatever pops out <laughs> pops out of the ground things like this happen in there and you meet someone named Pussy Galore it's like it would come out as a comedy more so than it would yeah. be a serious movie yeah. what what is the double o uh program in the books then like it's is it the best spies around because i feel like less so spies i've okay. never looked at them as they are spies they're never – he is rarely ever doing proper intelligence gathering mm-hmm. and intelligence work. I if anything, he is – very aware of that. If anything, he is sent in whenever there is a specific problem. And a lot of times you'll run across – he goes in there because agents who are already in the field have died, have been kidnapped, have been dis- – have, have been disappeared? Have disappeared. And he needs to figure <laughs> out what been happens. Have disappeared. And his whole goal is use – any means necessary to figure out what's going on and potentially put a stop to whatever bad things are happening. He's the closer. Mm-hmm. Hmm. That feels... That feels like it doesn't make sense among itself. Like, the fact that he's just a boring guy that interesting things happen to, but gets sent to, like, interesting places? Well, also, let's... Let, I think boring guy that things interesting happens to is a little bit of a simplification yeah it's he's not necessarily a super flashy all over the place kind of playboy like daniel craig Uh, like sean connery like sean connery okay yeah sean connery added a lot of zazz zazzle to it uh yep it's he was supposed to be the cold professional Mm. which is honestly why kind of daniel craig i think fits the bill a little bit better Mm -hmm. okay I think I I love Sean Connery and I think he's better. I'm still mad he ignored my wedding invite. Yeah. <laughs> he had the nerve to die on my wedding day. Oh yeah, that's true. Yikes, that did happen. That happened. Forgot that happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, what? Let, let's let's talk about the movies because that's the easiest thing for people to relate yeah. to and yeah. for you both to talk about intensely. Yeah. What do you think makes? a James Bond in the movies. Like what are what are the aspects that you kind of look for when you're watching the movies? Like you're watching and you you're watching a new one, like mm-hmm. a new actor. What 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 do you kind of think of when you're like this is what I expect from a James Bond? Person? They got to be they got to be cool. Character. They got to be cool. Got to be cool. That's just plain Define and simple. Define cool. No. <laughs> you can good podcast i'm on a pot i'm on a podcast in norman oklahoma do you really think i know what cool is <laughs> define what you think cool is in terms of james bond he is the ultimate masculine fantasy he drinks smokes womenizes and gambles all he wants and yet he's in tip-top shape and is always able to save the day and complete the mission he's got a great watch drives a killer car he seems you never see really a an annoyed Bond. You see sometimes an angry, vengeful, ready to go, but you never see him. He's unflappable. Mm-hmm. Great one. Yep. He's solid level. If he's happy, cool. Angry, usually, cool. Mm-hmm. Okay. What else? Irresistible to women. That's, I feel like that kind of fits in that uh, that same thing. So that, that's okay. So we've, we've, we've you know we've nailed the personality mm-hmm. of like what he's supposed to be like. Mm-hmm. Looks um, great in a speedo. Is that a is that a thing that happens that, often? Yeah. Is there Sean Connery in a speedo? Yes, oh, actually. Yeah. Um. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sorry, a speedo. What? Uh, what? Uh, what do you expect the story to be like? Well, and that's actually a good uh, mm-hmm. a question, kind of relating to the books as well. Like, yeah. Um. What do you expect the movie to do? Would you like to start? I'll start. Um, I think that ultimately the movies kind of fall into two separate categories, actually. Okay. Um, I think a lot of them, and I think a lot of what people think of the classic Bond formulation is 
Um, he goes on some mission and discovers there's some secret bad guy doing some secret bad guy plot with space lasers or something. Um, and he has to stop him. Um, he has some cool gadgets that he's picked up from Q, who is a mm-hmm. standby, and under the direction of M, who is a series standby. Um, and he uh, goes on the mission. He seduces one or several women and or men along the way, um, including usually someone who is, um, he is either seduced by or seduces someone that is close to the villain um, and often ends up getting betrayed uh, by them. He... Yep. <laughs> A few that I've seen. Good. <laughs> yep. Uh, he shoots a bunch of people, does some uh, things that would definitely spark some international incidents, and saves the day. Anything to add? Yeah. Um, I guess what I, you know, kind of, you asked, you know, what do I look for? I think, again, there are two kind of categories. Oh, I forgot to hit my second category. That was, oh. I oh. woke myself up and did one point out of two. Second, I think, is a little more... Get out of here, Brendan. <laughs> Screw what you were going to say. <laughs> it's a little closer to true espionage. And a lot of this is the Cold War era stuff. Hmm. Um, so I'm thinking of From Russia with Love, uh, The Living Daylights, um, even uh, the Brosnan one where he is on a torture wheel at the end. There's a submarine. can't remember which one that one is. Oh, Is it The World is Not Enough? Yes. Probably. Okay. Um, that one uh they tend to be more lower level um i mean it's still like he's fighting the kjb and the kgb's best super agents um but it's um it is more interested in the spycraft and the sneaking around and the forming alliances that's another thing that bond is really good at is he always has a friend in whatever exotic location Mm -hmm. he goes to and he's um very personable and makes friends easily and you see how he builds these relationships and how that helps him on his quests Okay. So we got the spy movie that I don't like and the spy movie that I would, in theory, like. Yeah, I mean, they're not super in-depth espionage movies, right. but they're more yeah. espionage formulated. Okay. This sounds like a dig on them, but they are not really deep. I think no. they are they are supposed to be fun, somewhat lighthearted, although it will dive into really serious kind of dark topics usually. Sure. Um But you go into it and you don't have like a normal kind of villain where it's, you know, oh, I'm going to take over New Jersey and I'm going to be the biggest crime boss over here, blah, blah, blah. It's I'm going to blow up the entire gold supply of Fort Knox in order to boost my own gold value and send the world into an economic downturn. You get outlandish things. And because it doesn't take itself seriously, it fits. It works. Mm Mm-hmm. It means you don't have to sit there and go, I'm going to analyze this plot until it has fallen into the ground. It's, okay, I really enjoy that. Oh, but I enjoyed this detail. I thought that was really cool how they did this. Mm-hmm. It's it's supposed to be a little fun. It's supposed to be just weird and kind of wacky. Again, I think mm-hmm. it's a very British style of making yeah. films. Mm-hmm. So uh, That always has been something that... Um... <sighs> I feel like lately they're trying to make things more grounded. Mm -hmm. Like they're trying to kind of like the blowing up the gold supply of Fort Knox on my own thing. And like there's been, uh, what was it? Um, Casino Royale, which was, um, it included uh, the dude shorting um, airplanes, airlines before Mm 9-11. There was like an element of like him doing that in the past. Like that just like kind of outlandish stuff but i feel like the more recent stuff is less like that yeah i would say casino royale is probably the most grounded of the series Um, okay at least among the recent ones um because it is much more about like just the the finances of he's he's going after a terrorist financier yeah that's true um you never mess with the money the money is always the core mm mm-hmm and I, that that's there's actually like a really hard split in the bond, like the whole timeline of it all, mm-hmm. and it starts with Timothy Dalton, 
at the end of the Roger Moore era, that's when things really stop. I mean, you still have some wild, wacky stuff. <laughs> but the sure. Brosnan era is, I mean, rife with that. Okay. But it's there is a really hard ton- tonal shift. And going from, all right, you're just Roger Moore in a suit at the age of like 800. Um, Sometimes in a clown suit. Don't remind me. <laughs> and somehow he's still climbing up like the side of a building or whatever or a wall. Mm-hmm. And then it goes to, okay, now we see a much sleeker, more visceral kind of Bond that's a lot more like, okay, I'm going to go here and I'm going to go through and shoot every person I come across mm-hmm. and figure out what's going on. Like, you're you're right, but that that is the beginning of that shift. Let's yeah. talk about that a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. Like... You guys have probably have seen have, having you, you having seen all of them multiple times um, can sort of identify like what each era, meaning each Bond, attempts to do. Um, you think maybe? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that you didn't more than like I have no like idea they what they, they have like a pretty common goal across all of them. I mm-hmm. mean, right. understandably, but right. each one does something very set and specific. So what's Connery's? Like, what's the thing that that comes to mind that distinguishes Connery versus the rest? With Connery and Moore, they're supposed to be the ultimate man of their respective decade. Okay. Connery is driving around in a DB5. He's got a killer suit on. He's got a Rolex Submariner, uh, which at that time was actually kind of... There's some real watch nerdery right there. Of like that was specifically for professional divers and military people. They were issued to like naval officers, and that's okay. his own background. It's you know, this dude did everything cool and slick. That was the '60s. Then you have Roger Moore who shows up in tan suits. He has a little bit more ploofed up hair. Mm-hmm. He'll be in some more wacky '70s and early '80s kind of stuff where it's you know. Okay, ha ha, all right, that's a little strange. And I, I stand by, Roger Moore is the only one who I don't think could kick my ass. <laughs> he is the least intimidating Bond by a long shot. <laughs> and I think that 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 changes a little bit going into, uh, I mean, they all kind of look like their respective decades ideals, but that like embodiment, I think, stops with Moore. And once you get to Dalton... It's supposed to be, hey, no, I'm actually a spy. Take me seriously. And they try too hard. Kind of follows the trajectory of comic books, where 60s is like the original stuff, the golden age. And then right. 70s mm. is sort of the uh, imitation well, and I things. Mean, golden age ended in 53, but that's fine. <laughs> there, there's a lot of... You know, you... Well, at golden age of Bond. Oh, like okay, it's the okay, original, okay. original see, stuff. Um, and then the, the 70s, the thing that comes after is a little more flaccid and a little less... Um, it's got less to it, less substance, mm-hmm. um, less excitement. Uh, and then the 80s with Dalton get a real hard edge to it, yeah. like you were talking about. And, I mean, culturally, you look at the kind of line, 60s, is Cold War, you had Kennedy in office. You'd never seen a young, in shape, kind of handsome president like that before. The 70s, you got Nixon. And then you got Gerald Ford. Everyone's wearing beige and polyester and the whole the whole idea is to be comfortable in everything. Yeah. That's the seventies, and that's reflected in the movies. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Who's next? Who's the next one uh, after Dalton? Pierce uh, Brosnan. Pierce Brosnan, Brosnan in the nineties. Get some of the extreme nineties a little bit. Yep. Yeah. A lot of uh, silver plastic. Yep. Silver plastic. Silver what? Things get bigger. The computer age starts yep. to take hold. Oh yeah. Yep. Um, Which I think I think some of my favorite. Uh, at least one of my favorite plots is from the Brosnan era. Okay. Uh, and that's from Tomorrow Never Dies. I've realized recently I have a horrible memory when it comes to exact movie titles, which sucks because I'm trying to be an expert right now. <laughs> uh, no, That's it's... okay. That's why we're an unqualified podcast. Exactly. Hey. Even our experts don't have to be the most qualified. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... Uh, he's supposed to... The main villain oh, is a media mogul. And his whole goal is to use various incidents that he causes or looks at to spin them in order to begin a war between the UK and China. Mm. And it's like, oh, this one's really cool. Also one of the most gruesome Bond villain deaths. That's something else. The villain almost always has to die a very, like, 
most everyone else gets shot. The villain gets, like, blown up by an air compressor <laughs> or gets fed into a giant drilling machine. How does or- Mickelson die? He just gets shot. Yeah. Because the Craig ones are more grounded. Yeah. That's true. Mm-hmm. Well, some of the deaths are pretty good. Quantum yeah. of Solace. 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 Villain death he... Sulake. He wanders into the, he's forced to walk into the desert and given only a bottle of motor oil and he drinks it after oh. out of desperation at some point. Hmm. So there's two other things I want to approach. Bond girls. That is a mm-hmm. that Hot is topic. an actual phrase because that's just something that happens in that franchise. Yep. What what is a Bond girl? And not just like, oh, it's the girl that Bond seduces or gets seduced by. Like, mm-hmm. what? why do they deserve a special title? Because it's almost a joke at this point. Like, and not yeah. for the women, uh, not in the sake of like the women. It's, <laughs> All the women are jokes. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Woo, that'd, be, that'd be bad to say. No, um, Your it's... wife is probably going to listen to this episode. <laughs> Gage, you can edit that together in an incriminating way, right? <laughs> You know, the swords are on her side of the bed. Uh, <laughs> no, it's... it. I mean, look, you had a movie in 1964 that got filmed in the U.S. where the Bond girl was named Pussy Galore. Yeah. <laughs> Another one was named Holly Goodhead. <laughs> like, it is it is so corny. Yeah. yeah. It, it is... I, I stand by something I said a while ago, and that is, I think it is outdated. And... Mm. The but bond, like the Bond girl, right? The, the whole idea of like it's just someone that he seduces. It's frequent now that you know the Bond girl who he does seduce is another agent, right? Yeah, from Russia, or, which like okay, that I feel a little bit better about because mm-hmm. it makes them have their own qualifications and story and makes them sure they're there for another reason aside from looking pretty, right? Which bothers me to no end. Yeah, they need a little agency, but right. Yeah, no, typically in the past they were either just eye candy or they're, um, in Pussy Galore's case, they're a villain henchman, henchwoman, mm-hmm. I guess. Um, and what either... was the, what was kind of the, the switch of, like, cause I, cause mm-hmm. in Quantum, or the Casino Royale, so that's as far back as I can go, mm-hmm. she's a badass in it. Yeah. Um, in her own way, yeah. In her own way. And so when do, when do you think that kind of, they realized, hmm, maybe respect women, <laughs> at least superficially? It's kind of peppered through. It, it can be a Gradual. little... Because, I mean, you get the henchwoman bonds that are scary enough in their own right. Mm-hmm. right? Xenia on a top. <laughs> What's these names? <laughs> I mean, come on. You have a movie called Octopussy. Yeah. Yeah. It... it... I can't say for sure, like, when it, re- like, for sure started. From Russia with Love, another agent, and it right. works there. And that's really yeah. early on. Yeah. And the, uh, and she's not, like, a proper agent, necessarily. Yeah. Like, I feel like that one, like, she has stakes within the plot herself, but she doesn't have as much agency as a character. Mm-hmm. She is just like, oh, this is the... um the pretty face that's going to fall in love with Bond. Yeah. And sometimes it's at least the, what I think are the funniest ones are you think they're the Bond girl, but they're actually working for the villain and they immediately die. Mm. Yeah. Just because it's like, aha, gotcha. Thought thought we had you go in there for something and they do something. What does piss me off about that usually is like, it's, they die in such a really stupid way. Mm -hmm. Um, I jumped to think of, uh, Live and let die. Mm. The the woman who you think is supposed to be like, okay, wow, she's, I think she was the first ever black technically Bond girl. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is 1971. Talk about that. Um, and turns out, no, she was working for the, for the villain and she runs off into the jungle and you just don't see her again. Because she gets scared by something that she probably knew was there and died. Huh. I mean, you, the, the whole thing you were saying about the way that they work is like, it has to be constant because it fit with my vague knowledge of like in, in Casino Royale. It's the one I've seen most recently. Mm-hmm. Um, same thing. 
Turns out she's a bad guy. Spoilers. Doesn't matter. We're talking about James Bond. If you haven't seen him, it's, you're probably not 15 interested. 15 years in old yeah. at this point. Yeah. Uh, turns out she's the bad guy and then dies by getting stuck in a cage underwater. Like, Which there there is a little bit more detail to that. I think the, the Craig movies are the first ones where they actually have like somewhat of a continuous thread through them. Aside from right. the fact that mm. Spectre exists and it is there. Yeah. Right. And that was... Uh, um, Craig was the first, um, actual, like, explicit reboot. It was the yep. first time they yep. actually, like, reused villains, which, what do you feel about that? It was probably time. Yeah. I mean, they were running out of material from Fleming's books at that point. Right. Mm-hmm. And Blofeld is such a, inspector as an organization, is such a Pandora's box. Mm-hmm. You can, you can pull whatever you want out of it. And fit it in because the whole organization is they function as terrorists, counter terrorists, whatever someone who's willing to pay them to do, they will do. Hmm. And especially right now, whenever the whole idea of the world, like, thank God, rarely it's country versus country in a conflict right now, but it's a country or a, or a group against an idea, against right. a place. It's it's a lot scarier. But it's so much more flexible when you're yeah. writing a story. Yep. Yeah. Um, no, I I like that they rebooted it because I think they were running out of places to go. Um, I don't love necessarily the interconnectedness of the Craig Bond. Okay. Um, I think that's a weakness overall, partly because Spectre was... It was sort of loosely connected before that, but then Spectre was kind of like... Oh, you remember those last three movies you saw? Guess what? They were all the same plot. It was all part of this master plan all along. Ah! And it it, da, da, da. it really feels like they were just making it, it up as they went along. Because they, they felt like they were retconning it. It was... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, you know, they mentioned like, oh yeah, all of these were connected. But you look back and it's like, okay, this sort of works. Y'all could have actually committed to the damn thing and gone yeah. through on it, but... Yeah. If they drop some big hints throughout there, like the Spectre Ghost, or is it an octopus? I don't know. I think it's a ghost. I think it's an octopus. Fair enough. Fight! Good fight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so they could have dropped some bigger hints and made it a little bit tougher. And yeah. They just they didn't know they wanted to do that. Yeah. And, and it's really tough to do whenever you have an actor who, by the time Skyfall came out, wanted to be done with it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because, bless his heart, he will have been Bond. I think he has the longest tenure. Longest as Bond. tenure, but not the most movies, I believe. Right. The, that's right. more who has yeah. that honor. Yep. Yeah. Um, Which typecasting is a thing. I mean, Connery after that, yeah, he had some different roles here and there, but he always had to become the kind of cool, usually older guy. So at the end Craig of the has some good, solid. Uh, and or uh, uh, counter typecasting roles before Bond, and actually yeah. kind of in the middle of it. So I think he'll be okay. I think he um, should. He yeah. he will not let himself be typecast. No, no. <laughs> he's. I mean, especially you can see it with uh, Knives Out. He yeah. mm. let himself have a lot of fun, and everyone liked it. And mm-hmm. so I think that is a single movie, if any, that is going to help him. Yeah, like, majorly so. Yeah, like break out of it and just have some fun with movies. Which this is one of those. Like, James Bond is one of those franchises at this point that I feel like it's... It's like Harry Potter, where the three stars just stocked away their massive profit from that movie. And they're just coasting now. The f*** is Radcliffe doing these days? <laughs> it, it, someone made a joke about, like, Snoop, because he was doing... Snoop Dogg, because he was doing random things. And it's like, he already completed the main story. He's just doing side missions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, I mean... Uh, Elijah Wood is a great example of that. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, he went from Lord of the Rings to Wilbur. Yeah. <laughs> like, just random crap that you don't Wilbur? expect. Wilfred. From... Wilfred, that's right. Wilfred, the... yeah. Which I forget is actually a thing. That was uh, a funny show. Did y'all ever see The Trust with Elijah Wood and Nicolas Cage? No. no. It's a sort of a dark comedy buddy cop movie. Is that um, one of the ones that Nick Cage randomly was good in? Yeah. He flips a coin when getting a role. Yeah. <laughs> It's a it's a little movie that like no one's ever heard of three million dollar budget. Um, huh. Nicholas Cage and Elijah Wood are buddy cut co- or they're cops in Vegas and Cage is a definitely a dirty cop and 
Elijah Wood is kind of just a just happy to be here kind of guy. Um, sort of nervous and neurotic, and they but team see, up to do a heist, and there's some fun plot twists along the way, and it gets kind of dark, and it's really great. But see, you could not reverse those roles. <laughs> <laughs> That'd just be confusing. <laughs> wow, we took a strong tangent. That's, That's what fine. we do. Check out the trust. Check that out. Yeah. Um, what are the questions you got, nerd? So we actually never finished one series of questions oh. uh, going through the Bonds and talking about kind of like oh, yeah. your yeah, opinions yeah. in general of the era and what you think that they are and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So what was we, we talked about Connery. We talked a little bit about... More. 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 We There's... skipped Lazenby entirely. We skipped yep. Lazenby entirely. Uh, we also skipped Niven. Doesn't, doesn't, really count. doesn't count okay good i want no. to take that out because you guys is, said six so there are there are technically seven people who have played james bond throughout like all of the history and everything and of all the movies there are two non-canonical movies and they're both niven no oh niven is one of them okay and that casino royale is i've watched it once you need to be tripping <laughs> to enjoy it is a weird movie i mean Formula One drivers. Oh, it from is the... a different Casino Royale. Yeah, no, yeah. it's a, it's a comedy. It's a and then Barry Nelson with Climax. Is that the other one? No. Oh. No. I thought that was Never Say Never Again. Yeah. Where uh, Sean Connery comes back in the 1980s. Oh. <laughs> Old man Bond up in here. I want to see. What's Climax? Climax exclamation point. The little boy's about to discover internet porn. <laughs> <laughs> Use incognito mode. Uh, what is that? What? I don't care anymore. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> this is what happens when we invite Brendan on. <laughs> I am the darkness. He is such a catalyst. Um, the another discussion question that I hope can we can stretch oh. out a little bit. Hold um, on, let's should we can should we well, yeah, finish we out? Oh shit, God! I keep, yeah, I'm the worst at this. We talked a little bit about Dalton. I've been off the... my ADHD medicine for five days, so I'm literally all. Place. I've had a busy week, so it's fine. So, uh, Dalton is the next one? Yes, Dalton's Timothy Dalton. Friends. He is in there for two movies, and as legend, rumor, fact at this point, I don't know, <laughs> it was because uh, Pierce Bro- they wanted Pierce Brosnan already, but mm-hmm. he was busy doing something else, and they couldn't get him. So they got Dalton as a placeholder for two movies. Mm-hmm. Huh. Uh, tough place to be. Really yeah. tough place, <laughs> because it... As much as I enjoy the last Moore movie, because it's so over the top eighties, it's it is it's objectively is one of the most terrible Bond movies of all. Which one is this? Uh, View to a Kill. Mm. Like I, it is corny as shit. Yep, I love it. It has the best <laughs> Bond song of all. It's sung by Duran Duran. Like it, it's oh, <laughs> Duran Duran sings the song. Grace Jones is the villain's henchwoman, and Chris Walken is the villain. Oh, and he's bleach blonde. That's he's that got movie. got like big ass thick glasses. Yeah. he's a Silicon Valley exec, and his I've goal. I've seen shots of him. You want to talk about uh, an over the top Bond villain plot? His idea is to blow up a portion of the San Andreas Fault. So that way an earthquake happens, causing a tsunami to wipe out all of Silicon Valley so his own tech company can take over the world. Oh my god, I thought you were going to go for the real estate one. Who's the, what's the real estate Superman. Joke? That's Superman. The original Superman. Yeah. <laughs> real estate business. Good old, just, oh my god. Real estate agents are the worst. That is hilarious. <laughs> but, uh, no, the Dalton ones are just... They, that's whenever they made the conscious decision to shift. They wanted something a lot more serious. Mm-hmm. At that point, Roger Moore was in like his 50s, I think. 60s, I think. Yeah, he was... He's old. But sorry, he, yeah, he was old. And with Dalton, you had, you know, a fresher, more aggressive kind of face. Mm-hmm. He fit in, I think, a little bit more to that kind of edge, edge and 80s mm-hmm. yuppie style. Mm-hmm. Sure. Problem was, at no point did he ever really look comfortable. Mm-hmm. He he always looked a little off. He yep. didn't carry himself with the same kind of movements. He just kind of seemed a little strange. I have a theory, but I'm going to hold on to it for now. And then after that, you shift to uh, Brosnan, who will go on. But I want to hear Matt's theory. I I'm, I'm going to hear I'm hold on to it for now. Okay, say a couple key words that will remind you, because I have taking notes so that I can If it. If we get into the debate, I will remember. It's my key point for de- defending Dalton. I'll defend Dalton. Key I will defend Dalton. <laughs> 
I think he, if you watch those movies back, and also I'm sticking on Dalton briefly, I think his movies, I know uh, Goldeneye has the highest body count in terms of how many mm-hmm. people Bond has killed. I think License to Kill is the bloodiest. Okay. Like the way that he, that the some of the villains and main baddies are killed, like one dude is put inside of a pressure chamber and they basically set it up to where he's just suffering from all from all the over top over the top pressure or whatever that's going on. They release the pressure and then all you just see is blood go everywhere. Ooh, nice. um, they me. they Have kill you seen the Kingsman movies. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, one villain is dumped into a cocaine grinder. Oh, that's the dream. And is just <laughs> and the oh hold on what about this one? The main villain is burned to death in a cocaine gasoline mixture. Oh, that is the dream. I mean, the most 80s way to go. Yeah. <laughs> All it and needs it... to be in is a white Ferrari and a white jacket with the sleeves rolled up. Yep. I wonder if that has... Uh, when 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 was the war on drugs, like, really? Like, then. That was then? Yeah. Uh, That's good Reagan. Old, uh, media good old propaganda. Reagan. Love it. Yep. And, There's uh, a... Real quick. Um, in preparation for this uh, episode, I did a little bit of research... Um, and there is a woman, Doctor. I cannot remember her name. I can look up. I emailed her. Um, she is a professor at OU, and she has published multiple books about female characters in the Bond franchise. Oh. Like that is her. Like it's a very niche speciality. Yeah, but a and good I, one. It is so. It's like she kind of ties it to women in action movies in general, mm-hmm. and I'm like. I need to interview her. Can and we like, have her on? That's I, yeah. I, I emailed her about that, and mm-hmm. I and that's like one of the we, as we mentioned, like content episodes will be more thoroughly researched. Uh, we want to talk about um, marginalized groups in mm-hmm. uh, in entertainment, and women is one of the easy ones to go for first. Mm-hmm. And I think I want to talk to her in depth about that. Yeah. You... I've already opened that dialogue with her. Can you cool. send me what like whatever? Uh, documents and published oh, yeah, papers sure. you have because uh, I know Emily I know would love to read that oh, oh, yeah. oh absolutely she She'd would all over that uh, uh, Emily's her wife by the way so that her people wife? who aren't like her wife my wife your wife jackhole ah you know <laughs> uh, who's next so that's Dalton you have anything else to say you want to say about Dalton 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 Pierce Brosnan Pierce, Pierce Brosnan. Brosnan he's the dude he's the one I feel like he like without uh, like it's Connery Brosnan and uh, 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 who's the current one? Craig. Craig. Are the three like that? I know of Pierce Brosnan. I always. He's my mom's favorite, like for sure. He's, I think mm-hmm. he, I believe he's Kalen's favorite. He. So I think the weird part about the Brosnan era is that whenever that's whenever you start seeing some interesting movements by the franchise itself, mm-hmm. they got sponsored by BMW and Omega. Omega's a watch company. That's why, like, traditionally, Bond wears Rolexes and a couple of other, like, mm-hmm. Accutron or weird stuff. After, after once Brosnan steps in the role, Omega Seamaster, that is it. And he even makes specific references to that throughout. It's a little bit of product placement. Mm-hmm. BMW sponsored them, and that's why, like, the BMW Z3, its global debut was Goldeneye. Huh. Yeah. Uh, and that's why... All the Pierce Brosnan movies, he's driving a BMW, except for the very end is whenever he uh, gets an Aston Martin again. Mm, but he's in, yeah, he's in a seven series, he's in a Z3, and it's it works because that was, I think, BMW's like pinnacle of prestige in a way. Mm-hmm. But it 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 fits the '90s kind of theme. And I mentioned like silver plastic. I think of the '90s. I think of really rounded objects, a lot of things painted gray and silver and a lot of plastic kind of thing, like a game controller. Mm. That's what I think of when I think that. Yeah. Yeah. The plots get a little wackier and a little bigger, a little mm. more global. Maybe. They wanted to bring it back to something back. Excitement. Yeah. So what years were these in? Uh, Brosnan, first one was probably about 91, 92. Some, yeah, and ended in 02 with... Uh, uh, Die Another Day was... Yep. O two, which I saw in theaters. That's impressive. And we're here's a here's a nerd fact for that. Five years old, six years old. Yep. No, no nerd facts allowed. What do you think this is? An entertainment nerd podcast. Get out of here. Okay. 
No, uh, we need him. <laughs> when I when I saw that movie, um, the this is going to date me so hard. Uh, I date you so hard. Hey, I'm taken. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there was a delay in the movie. Like the movie stopped abruptly because the reel of film broke. Oh, it wasn't huh. digital. Like we saw, like the actual frames, like. <laughs> And they had to stop. It was like a 20-minute delay as they got like another copy of it and put it back on. <laughs> That's funny. I was so confused. <laughs> <laughs> Is this part of the movie? It's like one of those fourth wall breaking ones where they like, it breaks the, like they stop the movie or something. Record, record scratch. Yeah. Like Hello, the, James Bond here. Film melts and then the cartoon character walks out in front of the melting film. Yep. Anyway. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> But you 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 get some interesting things. I've actually seen a couple of the uh, Bond cars from that era. Mm-hmm. I've seen the green Jag that they used in uh, Die Another Day. Mm-hmm. Nice. Um, I've seen a couple others. I'm not thinking about them right now, as I should be. But that's a normal thing. Uh, but yeah, it's you get a little bit more of the traditional style of okay, really pretty Bond girl, really handsome Bond himself. You get some wackier gadgets. You get double entendres thrown in there. That's what my mom always throws in. Uh, that's her. She loves the double entendres. She doesn't mm-hmm. like it whenever it gets super serious. Mm-hmm. Um, and you knew that from your discussions with her about Star Wars. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a rabbit hole. Uh, but yeah, it, it's a little bit more of a return to form, but at a different direction. And that yeah. direction is primed for Mr. Daniel Craig. Mm-hmm. Yes. But Daniel Matt, Craig. what do you have to throw on Pierce Brosnan? I spoke all over you. I'm sorry. No, I don't have a lot to say about Brosnan. Um, I, I think you hit everything that I would have liked to have been able to have said. He opens up with Sean Bean as his main villain. Yeah. Good old Sean dies in every movie Bean. Yep. He's the villain in a Bond movie. Yeah. So. And well, he's, I mean, yeah. he's a, a, a double O agent who turns on MI6. Ah. Yeah. Because of Welsh nationalism or something. Something like that. Or something. <laughs> what year would have that what year was that? Like ninety two. Somewhere yeah. around there. Early or ninety three maybe. When was I'm digging into my the crown knowledge right now. Are you thinking of the IRA? Because that's Ireland. No, there was like a thing with Prince Charles when he was in school. Oh, he specifically tried to show himself as more Welsh. More Welsh, and so he yeah. spoke Welsh in his speech. Yeah. Um, Daniel Craig. Daniel Craig. Daniel. The craigest. R. R. Martin Craig. The the <laughs> craigest of Daniels. The Bond who I think has pissed off the most people, namely my mom. <laughs> <laughs> but did she, so she must have missed the speedo scene. Probably. Yeah. I think she thinks she that he's pretty. But He's she guy. doesn't like things that are serious. Why can't Why can't this Bond smile more? Why can't he crack more jokes? I'm like, I don't think I've ever seen Daniel Craig's. No, I've seen him smile. He smiles in slightly. Oh yeah, he smiles, smiles a couple of times in Bond movies. Munich. Oh yeah, he smiles in Casino Royale a little bit because yeah. it's before his heart is ripped out of his soul. That's true. <laughs> yeah, that is like the hardest. Casino Royale has one of the hardest to watch scenes for me of any movie. It's in the top three. Which one? The open bottom chair. Oh. <laughs> oh, what a scene. Yep. That was so creative. That, yeah. It was like, I know that. I is, loved it, and I, I was like, this is. That is, because that is like a. This is going to sound really gruesome. There are a lot of different methods of torture that people don't really touch on in movies. That's one of the mm-hmm. more creative ones that, like, if you want to shock an audience. That will shock the shit out of one. Yep. Mm-hmm. It's it's a perfect... I think it really is the perfect thing for the Craig Bond. Don't do that hand motion with that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really the perfect thing for Craig's balls. <laughs> no, because um, it's it's grounded. Like, it's a yeah. real-life torture method. Yeah. But it's over-the-top and super Bond villainy at the same yeah. time. It it's captures also both like, spirits. If you want to terrify half your audience... That's a great way to do it. Mm-hmm. It's also very thematically well placed because Bond is so much like the perfect man. Mm-hmm. How better to bring a man down than literally the thing that a man is defined by? Let's emasculate him, literally. <laughs> and also, let's do it in such a way like 
in terms of shooting it where you feel isolated. Mm. It, it's not like there's mm. someone behind the glass wall listening and recording. Like, yeah. you are alone. No one will hear you scream. Yeah. Yep. Naked and afraid. Yep. yep. So. And yes, by the way, the uh, the crash in that movie, that was real. Not like someone accidentally did that and that's just what, like, they had one opportunity to make that crash happen with the Aston. The car crash where he has to flip it to avoid running her over. Yes. You know, that, is a, that is a real Aston Martin DBS. Set the that world gets... record for the most times a car flipped over. Yep. Oh. Yeah. Well, it's, fine. that that scene also makes me hurt quite a bit. <laughs> In a different way. Yeah. Um, so on that note, where do you think it's going with Bond? Like, where, what do you do? You think that No Time to Die will be anything that's different beyond the other Craigs? And then, if it's not, what do you think is the next step for James Bond? I worry that No Time to Die is going to be just another specter, another oh look, everything's all tied together. Mm-hmm. Look at this; it's all been the same masterminded plot. Um, it seems like they have a different, just one-off villain this time, which would be good. Yeah, that's one of the things that the bond franchise does when it's at its best is it has a new exciting villain with their own fun little quirks every mm-hmm. time. Right? You're never bored with them. Yeah. Looks like Rami Malek is going to hit that beat. Mm-hmm. I have faith we'll in him. I, I believe in him. He's, he's a great actor. Um, if it does, it'll have some fun gadgets. It'll have some, uh, it's got Ana de Armas yes. and Lashana Lynch, who's not a bond girl properly, but she's more of the agent that he kind of flirts with, mm-hmm. I guess. Yeah. Good combo right there. I I genuinely don't know. Hmm. It could be ooh, this is the the point where they say, all right, Bond, I think they're going to have to look at it and go, Bond has to change at this point. But if they do, they're at a really good opportunity for it. Because mm-hmm. they've got a new M, they've got a new Q, they've got Money Penny back in there. Mm-hmm. Like you've got a lot of stuff set up for what is because so much of the of the originals are all right. Let's tie this into the Cold War. The Soviets are always a part of something, or they are looped into it somehow. How do you make that work in the modern cinema? Yeah. Do you make? Do you have the Chinese government come in to play more? Do Not you have you the Chinese share of the Chinese box office? That's true. true very true. Which is a giant portion of the. Which is why box you office. won't see that. Exactly. Um, you know, do you have things tied into? I feel like we're definitely going to see a movie that has to do with Afghanistan now that we're like, yeah. that's wrapping up a little bit. It's I not, want I'm not the person say... who thinks that it's just over. <laughs> I want to say Bond's actually been to Afghanistan. Yeah, uh, The Living Daylights. He spends like the last 45 minutes of the movie hanging out with the Mujahideen. Oh, yep. Muad'Dib? Yes. <laughs> he is Muad'Dib. <laughs> <laughs> James Bond is Muad'Dib. <laughs> Brendan doesn't get that joke. Nope. Dude. Dude. Are you Dune for Dune? He's not Dune for He's Dune. He's not Dune for Dune. I might know be. Dune. I, I know of Dune. You know of. And Emily got a really, really nice copy of the book in our house that I am thinking of reading. Come on, dude. You binged Game of Thrones. You gotta read Dune. You gotta read Dune. <laughs> I need to finish uh, Memory of Sorrow of Thorn first. What's that? It's actually it's the... Not Dune. No. It is the fantasy high fantasy trilogy that inspired Martin to write Game of Thrones. Oh, Nice. Not Dune, though. No, not Dune. Not Dune. Not Dune. But the so, movie looks great, so I'm interested in that. It will be. Did you have anything else to say? I kind of interrupted you with the Afghanistan comment. No, uh, if I if I could say them doing anything, it's going to be more, how do we make it, and I hate the potential of this, how do we make it relate more to Gen Z? Yeah. If they do, if they do the next, I think, big, scary villain... It's going to be something with social media. Oh, God. It definitely and there is, is going to be. There is a treasure trove of stuff you can pull out of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, it, you can have some serious fun with them potentially, like, you know, brainwashing or whatever. Yeah. Then yeah. you start having... <laughs> Even just more grounded misinformation campaigns. <laughs> yeah. About to say, is there a villain using 5G as something? <laughs> 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 Surprise role by Alex Jones. <laughs> The villain is, oh god, <laughs> using 5G to turn the frogs gay. <laughs> <laughs> that, okay, wait, Um, the sheriff, the sheriff in the, like, early Moore days. Mm. <laughs> they 
could use them as that is just like the topical <laughs> idiot that they throw in there yes. for for some kind of plot continuation. There, there's there's like this one sheriff in the earlier days. He's I think from Louisiana, mm-hmm. and he always pops up at like weird random opportunities, and he helps Bond in some way or chases him, <laughs> and it's comical because he he is a caricature. He's a caricature of everything country southern american mm-hmm. and he's like wait wait this we got this guy from england we're gonna chase him down and <laughs> are bond movies american movies no they're definitely british movies they're definitely british movies to me okay I, if they're if you want to see an american bond movie you watch mission impossible which leads to my big question towards the end do you think mission impossible influenced the trajectory of game of James Bond. James Bond? I don't say influence trajectory. I think it aided it. But I think also they came around the same time where the Bond movies were already shifting. Right. Um, yeah, I don't I don't think it influenced it really. Okay. Um it came into the fold, Mission Impossible did kind of as a um not a successor to Bond, but trying to occupy some of that same market share. Right. Um because you wanted to see someone not in their 60s trying to do all these stunts and everything. You wanted mm-hmm. to see the most exciting man in Hollywood at the time. You wanted to see Tom Cruise. He flew fighter jets or whatever. Yeah. He does his own stunts. Yeah, and the first two movies, the second Mission Impossible movie, really feels like a lower-end Brosnan Bond movie. When um, was the first movie? 96. First, first, mis- first, sorry, James Bond movie. Oh, first James Bond movie? Like 62. Yeah. Okay, because the first Mission Impossible series uh season was in 1966 mm-hmm. so i wonder if mission impossible is completely just a copy of james bond all the way if you wanted to make an american spy movie you got to make it more dramatic you got to make it more intense more yeah, you gotta nuke everybody all right. the time you've got always nukes you've got to have it's always nukes of james bond anyway yeah sure someone's trying to steal a nuke or whatever yeah um no you you if you wanted to make an American Bond movie, you do that because you have more explosions, more intense fight scenes. Not, I'm going to dress up in a tuxedo, walk into this, you know, casino in the middle of the Macau Harbor mm-hmm. and schmooze with people drinking a martini. If it's an American movie, you go through, you drill a hole and start sinking the whole thing. <laughs> it, it's, no, there's a, a different level of operating around it. And I think, sorry. I'm yeah. stepping over you. No. I think part of that, it, the original premise of Bond, it's like Bond is someone who seems relatively boring, but interesting things happen to. That's the that's the epitome of the British Empire at the time. Mm. You look at, all right, this guy's walking out of London, out of High Street, and he's or off of Savile Row, and he's got on a fine-trimmed suit. Where are you going to drop him? India. Brazil. What is the most un-British place possible? place where people are dancing around half naked with feathers and colors and music and people actually having fun and eating food that isn't brown. Or actually, no, it's still brown, but it's got flavor. <laughs> it's like, you do that. That's the interesting location. The Brits the Brits love a place that's not Britain. And they love a good baddie that's not... As do Americans. I feel like everyone loves a good place that's not where they are. I was going to say, there's a, there's a colonialism joke in there somewhere. <laughs> there, and I will say, there are sometimes a, a, a bit of a imperialist overtones throughout Bond. Sure. It's, yeah. why is the British Empire still focusing in this area? <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of British supremacy, shall yeah. we say. British exceptionalism. Let's fight. Let's fight. Let's fight. So we're going to do this. how we're going to do this. I have these six bonds, six important bonds, canonical bonds. Mm-hmm. I will can bond, each... Can, can a bond canonical? You left Lazenby in there, didn't you? Yes, I did. Damn it. So what we're going to do is we're going to do two comparisons. Each of you are going to be randomly given one of them. Uh, we're going to do it twice. But before we do that, I'm going to let each of you veto one of the bonds that you don't think you can defend well. And before you decide which one you want to veto, I'm going to tell you the five categories. Okay. Best villain, best Bond girl, best coolness, best spyness, and then a wild card on, like, how you, like, just any other things that particularly that Bond is, like, unique Mm -hmm. and you want to defend that. So, given those categories, 
Which bonds would you like to yank out of there? I'm probably fine. Lazenby. Probably Lazenby. I, and I think it's, I love that movie. Like the movie itself was great. His performance fell flat, just didn't fit. And I don't think there's enough there to really defend him. Okay. I could defend Lazenby, but I guess he's vetoed. Yep. Uh, I'll get rid of Roger Moore. Rid of Moore. Ooh, that's a lot though. Wait, is, on, or is it vetoed for each other? For both of you, yeah. Oof. So <laughs> the two of you, like, so there are four now total possibilities. Uh, mm-hmm. Craig, Connery, Dalton, and Brosnan. Mm-hmm. I'm going to change my random generator. Don't know why I left it like that. Okay. Brendan, your yep. person is Brosnan. All right. Versus Matt Connery. All right. I like so, this. This is, a good, this is a good pairing right here. So, Brendan, I'll let you go first. Uh, Let's go with villains. Villains. Defend his villains. His villains are excellent in okay. a lot of different ways. Why? Because they start branching out of the realm of, I'm going to make... You know, some of them do some outlandish things, but I think that's what's fun. And they they pick on the right boogeyman. Mm -hmm. One of them has relations to North Korea. Mm -hmm. What does he want to do? He wants to build a giant laser to blow up and carve out everything imaginable. That's crazy. That's wild. That's a scary villain. If you want to scare a lot of people, if you want to say, if you want to scare a lot of people, giant North Korean laser. That's all I'm saying there. Okay. Keep going on that. I've said it before. Giant media mogul trying to spin things in a scary way. That's really relevant right now. That's yeah. really scary yeah. right now. I, I, I think that is that. a lot of power way ahead of his time. Mm-hmm. Dorky of a character. Sure. But in the right kind of way. Then you got the one and only Sean Bean. Of course. You cannot fault Sean Bean. And he does what one he does in movies best. And that is and die. die. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever heard that, no, you do much more, Sean. I love you. Um... But I, I think he has arguably the best villains out there because okay. they, they can be tied to so like a much more broad range mm-hmm. of things that can terrify everyone from the most powerful to the least powerful. Okay. There's something there for everyone to be fair enough. All right. I think that's a good argument. I think it's a valid argument. I think you're coming at it from the wrong direction there. So don't think- don't pull any of this like episode one fifty shit of like your Bond's villains are closer to God. <laughs> <laughs> my Bond villains, my Connery's Bond villains are objectively better because. <laughs> no. Should have prepared you for Matt's debate. I I have a feel like the second he looked at me, I'm like, all right, my cheeks are going to get clapped on this, aren't they? <laughs> well, so you talk about fear. And I think, I think this is really just more of a, an argument between eras because by Brosnan, by the 90s, they are going a little more serious, um, trying to be a little more relevant. And I think Connery, you're going back to the original, you're remembering that these are movies, this is entertainment, you want entertainment. And yes, I get that fear can be entertainment in and of itself. I mean, horror movies are a thing for a reason. But you think about the iconic Bond villains, the ones that have brought the most entertainment, and it's Dr. No, it's Goldfinger, it's these guys that have the crazy schemes and the elaborate plots and the big larger than life personalities and then you set that aside and you've even got like the um from russia with love you've got um thunderball you've got the things where it's more specter it's more espionage and finding out information and um you get a a mix of both the cold war zeitgeist and the big larger than life entertaining ones i have no retort for that he's okay. right Hmm. This really does suck because I per- personally, I think that Moore has some of the most fun villains. <laughs> They're so bad in some cases. You've got, you've There's literally got a freaky looking Elon Musk as a villain. I think, because this is totally subjective on who wins. I'm going to go with Matt on that one. Yes. I should probably go first on the I second will see, category. I will see at this point. Yep. Matt. Mm-hmm. Why does Connery have the best Bond girls? Because he is the sexiest man, and girls just kind of fall all over him. He's got one named Pussy Galore. Yes, I'm aware. Which is that has been pretty brought great. to my attention countless times in this episode. How many times do we have to say that name in order for this to potentially get demonetized? <laughs> <laughs> we're, 
Do you assume we're monetized at all? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think um, there's the limitations of the era here is that females weren't characters at this point in the Bond franchise. Up to a point. From Russia with Love, you get um, the the KGB agent who thinks she's a KGB agent um, and is given a little more agency, a little more of a personality. Um, she's kind of in a tough situation and has to do what she has to do. Um, you get some of the iconic henchwoman ones and the more interesting ones, Pussy Galore, um, Honey What's-Her-Face from... Honey Rider. Rider. Honey Rider? Yep. <laughs> Which is the nickname for Aston Martin's current F1 car. Yep. Um, let's see. What are some other Connery Bond movies? Uh, Thunderball, Domino, has a lot more agency than any of the previous Bond girls. She actually is the one that ends up killing the villain. Um, and she is instrumental in the plot and much more of a character unto herself. So I think that within the limitations of the era, you have a wide degree of variety and you have some steps in the right direction, at least. Where his movies stepped, Brosnan's ran. <laughs> and I just can say three words. Brendan has such a much better like sense of like the dramatic debate style. <laughs> You've met my family. Yeah. <laughs> three words. Hallie Barry. She's a Bond girl? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, die shit. another day. She die another day. And she has a ton of agency. Mm -hmm. She is always through there. Uh, I'm blanking on her name, but she is one of the villains in uh, where they're in Istanbul in the submarine. I mentioned it earlier. Yep. yep. Uh, um, world is not enough. World is not enough. Yes. Um, her method of killing people, specifically men, is to break their ribs in sex with her legs. Xenia on a top. Hence the name. Yep. yep. That one right there is a, is a little hard to defend. But <laughs> but that movie has two other Bond girls. Yes. Why you... am I helping you? Because <laughs> <laughs> you feel mercy for this one boy who's not good at no, debates. No, I think I'm losing this point. So <laughs> No, uh, I think with Connery's, you actually... I stand on my point earlier of where the, where the Connery Bond girls were beginning to explore different realms or whatever... Brosnan, they were a lot more developed. They still have they still have plenty of room to grow in that regard. Sure. But they suddenly become so much more detailed and intricate to the plot. And I think that's why they are better overall. Definitely giving this one to Brendan. I think I was gonna lose that one yeah. no matter what my <laughs> argument was. You're uh you had you had one good bond girl in there that was like at least had some like mm -hmm. not just being the eye candy. Well, um, I mean, eye candy's an argument and unto itself. Only other defense is the like. And you want to go up against Halle Berry? Yeah. I will say against Halle Berry, Catwoman two thousand four. Uh... <laughs> I will say in her defense for that, she showed up to the Razzies ceremony and gave an acceptance speech. Oh really? Yep. Oh, I do respect her so much. By the way, <laughs> <She's> <laughs> I hate great. that movie with with a burning passion, but I like her. Also, uh, Anne Hathaway. But... The. Uh... Uh, the argument of like it, the restrictions of the time is such a weak argument, yeah. especially yeah. just you know general like progressive society. But I mean, I, I, it's a really weird one to talk about because at the end of the day, they are trying to make a movie and that makes money. In the '60s, it would have been really difficult for them to do something really crazy and maintain massive commercial success. Yeah. It's not defending that, that by any right. means, no. but it is at least explaining some of it. Yeah. Right. Sex sells, and at that point, the submissive woman was the attractive model, which is why Connery slapped him all the time. Down with the patriarchy, coolness. Uh, who's uh, so that'd Brendan be, leads uh, on this Brendan. one. Brendan. So, oh. why is your bond cooler? <laughs> he knows he's not he knows <laughs> i touched on earlier why i think connery's my favorite and the coolest this is tough um all right name a name a modern actor who is more handsome in his prime than pierce brosnan uh, army hammer henry cavill uh, Luke, uh, uh idris, idris elba, elba. <laughs> daniel craig 
Let's take Army Hammer out of this debate. Though. I had I had that ready. The moment, like I could tell you were going for the handsomeness, and I was just like, I've got this ready. <laughs> he, why? Okay, so while Eagle Mortensen, Ryan Gosling, Ryan Reynolds, Matt Dalthorpe, Preston Robefuss. Oh, get out of here! Oh, get out of here Gross. with your positivity. <laughs> Uh, it's like, look, I have one positive moment a week. I'm not going to waste it. <laughs> <laughs> Emily's mad. Um, no, there's, I think, this is really tough. This is a really, really tough one. Mm-hmm. Because I think he is a he is an exceptionally cool character. Mm-hmm. But... <laughs> Connery's got it in that regard. It, and you he, really just, just like franced it there, the didn't you? I, 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 look, there's not much I can do. He is really cool. It's comparing number one to number two to me. Yeah. I think there is an argument in Brosnan's direction just to pitch in for the other side before I go for the kill. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes. What is it? The, uh, uh, sometimes a weak form of pity is the, the most for- strong, is the strongest form of cruelty. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. A la, a la Georgia Tech versus Cumberland, nineteen sixteen. Yes. Yes. Nineteen, yeah, yeah. Wow, I watched that video like four times in the past week. Same here, same here. What? Oh, you know, it's because we just completely clobbered West Carolina. And, That's fair, and, and we're just like also, yeah. I'm in the mood for some like bloodbath. <laughs> it it is it, uh, blow up the spot. Also, all of his videos are really good. Oh yeah, they're they're exceptional. It, he does it in such a great way. Have you seen the video explaining? It's no. by it's by um, John Boyce. John Boyce okay. with uh, sports SB Nation. SB Nation. Mm-hmm. We can really watch good. it afterwards. You'll love it. Yeah, yeah. you will. I'm love aware it. of both of those channels. Yeah, he does a really good video. job explaining the whole thing. He does a really good job. It is but hysterical. All right, now back to uh, back to you, back to Brosnan. Right? I think Brosnan plays a little bit more of a demure demure Bond. He's a little lower key. Um, his delivery it makes the delivery on the one liners really work because it kind of just slides out of nowhere. Um, and he's he's. He's got that unflappable attitude that you were talking about. Like he's he's rolling down the street in a tank and his hair is perfect. Mm-hmm. But that being said, Connery is just he's the ideal here. He's got the sense of humor. He's got the the wink and the smile, but he can go like cold, stone cold killer. He looks great in a suit. He looks great in a speedo. He looks great in a towel. Um, he drives the flashiest cars with that casual confidence that you want. He plays cards with that casual confidence that you want. Um, he smokes cigars with that casual confidence that's kind of problematic nowadays. But you know what? <laughs> <laughs> it was epitome of cool at the time. And it still speaks to some little bit of our inner masculine. There's self. a reason fashion is going back towards style from the 60s and not style from 2001. Yep. I... I cede my victory or any hope of a victory I had to this to Matt. You, I, I'm not going to give you the satisfaction of doing that. <laughs> I explicitly am viewing Sean Connery from like Hunt for Red October and Le- League of Extraordinary <laughs> Gentlemen in a Speedo and a towel. And he's like slightly overweight, very old. Have you and- seen Have you seen the, the Zardoz outfit? The what? Oh, no. Google Z A R D O. SZ? Pull that up, Jamie. Probably something I've come across. That being said, Hunt for Red October, uh, Connery, is that is a handsome ass man. (laughs) That is a refined gentleman. Oh boy, he pulls off the old silver fox. Talk about it. Like, I think a movie that does not get enough love. Oh, it's great. It was a wonderful movie. Yeah. Have you read the book? No. Oh. I mean, a lot of Tom Clancy is just kind of the same thing, but that was his first book. And man, it changed the game. Do you know that he got debriefed by uh, U.S. intelligence because they thought he had stolen state secrets somehow because of how accurate he was on a bunch of stuff that hadn't been declassified? <laughs> okay, there's there's a, a really strong metalhead argument of the time you know that you write the best music is whenever people start trying to, or like when really important people tell you mm-hmm. that 